I would like to start with a story that I'm calling Me and the Groupers. In my <clears throat> fourth year of teaching, I moved from uh, one state and one school to a new school in a new state. So I had three years of teaching under my belt, and I was really excited because all that beginner stuff was done. I knew what I was doing, and I was ready for this new challenge. Now this school, like all schools, had its share of problems. The students had lots of baggage, you know, the school had a tight budget, and you know, all the teachers, like all teachers everywhere, were short on time and short on energy, but I, I knew about that, I was ready for it. But after a couple of weeks, I started to realize that there was gonna be a new challenge that I was not expecting. My colleagues. I was noticing that every time I had some new idea that I wanted to share, something I was excited about, I would share it with the other teachers and I would get a reaction back that I wasn't sure what to do with. It was like my enthusiasm bothered them. It was like they felt the need to put a damper on it almost immediately. So <clears throat> I, would, I would have this new idea for something I wanted to try in the classroom and I would talk to somebody about it, and they would say, yeah, that'll work with our kids. Or maybe I would just be speaking positively about some new initiative that my principal wanted us to do. And they would say, oh, just wait. Pendulum is gonna swing back in a couple of years. Don't get too excited. So I talked to a friend of mine at the school about this phenomenon, and right away she knew exactly what I was talking about. Grouper, she said. They're like groupers. That's how they react to everything. They sit there with those frowns on their faces. <laughs> she said, don't even bother with them. Well, I didn't listen. I kept trying. And I'd come at them with my great ideas. I'd be sitting at lunch and I'd be like, okay, hey, I've got this problem I'm, I'm having with my students. You know, I, I'm wondering if anybody could give me some advice. And they would say, up, that, that, that. No talking shop at lunch. Or maybe I had something that went really well and I wanted to share it with them. I'd say, oh my gosh, my second period today went so well. The kids were so focused. And I'd hear from the other side of the room, somebody would mutter under their breath, yeah, they were probably stoned. So my enthusiasm started to wane. Every time I shared something new and I got that reaction, I started to doubt the validity of anything that I was sharing. And after a while, I just stopped sharing altogether. And when I look back on my years in the classroom, of all the mistakes that I made, it is this. It is this holding back, this withholding of ideas that could have really made a huge difference in my school. That holding back is my biggest regret. And since then, in all of the years since I left the classroom, I have been obsessed with the question of what could I have done differently? Now, I know I'm not the only one who deals with groupers because I see them on social media. Let's take this post from Edutopia, for example. Fantastic program. Struggling students are assigned to a teacher. They check in with them for a few minutes in the morning and a few minutes in the afternoon. Fantastic. The post did so well. I got hundreds and hundreds of positive comments, teachers saying, oh, we need to try this, we need to do this in our school. But of course, there were also the groupers. There were the teachers who only saw more work for themselves. And then there were the teachers who were the been there, done that crowd, who saw it immediately, didn't even read the article, and said, oh, yeah, we tried that already, it didn't work. And then there was the not my job group. Somebody else should be doing this. This is not something we should be giving to teachers. These objections, this pushback, it is everywhere. And it has the power to stomp on great ideas until we stop sharing them all together. And that negativity, that pushback, is only a small part of what makes it hard to bring about positive change in our schools. Which brings me to the title of this talk. When I was thinking about the complexity of this issue, of this idea that we are all gonna be trying to go back to our schools and, and try something new and do something different, I was looking for a metaphor to kind of capture it. And what I settled on was an airplane. 
So say this airplane represents a school, and we are trying to get our school someplace that we're going to call progress. Progress is a place where all of our students are successful and healthy, where our faculty is fulfilled, and where every day we feel like we are contributing to our community and we are raising up a fantastic next generation. When we go to conferences like this one, we load up on ideas that are going to get us to progress. We've got our little tote bags. We're going to fill them up with ideas. We hear about a new strategy we want to try. We're going to try that at our school. We learn about a new tech tool. I want to try that. We hear about all these great programs that other people are doing. We've got to do this at our school. We're going to go back to our school. And so by the time we're done, we are fired up. We are pumped. We are ready to go to progress. And then we get back to our schools. And for some reason, that plane never gets off the ground. We need flying lessons. If we are going to make progress, we have got to figure out how to maximize the forces that are going to work to get our planes flying and minimize the ones that work against it. So a quick lesson in aerodynamics from somebody who knows this much about aerodynamics. There are four forces that work on a plane that is trying to fly. The first one is lift. Lift is the force that picks the plane up off the ground. It's upward motion. And it's determined by the shape of the wings. So in other words, it's something that the engineers can control. If you change the shape of the wings, you can get more lift on the plane. The equivalent of lift in our schools is the stuff that we actually have some control over. It's things like our methodology in the classroom. It's the design of the room itself. It's the materials, the technology that we choose. It's the systems and procedures we've put into place. It's the stuff that we learn about at these conferences. The force that works in opposition to lift is weight. That is the force of gravity that weighs it down. This is the stuff we really have no control over. When somebody's designing a plane, they can try to choose lighter materials, but really sometimes things are just heavy. So in schools, weight is things like poverty, it's budget constraints, it's student readiness, it's the stuff that we are handed and we have to make the best of it. The third force is drag. Drag is what pulls the plane backwards. I've got to look at where this diagram is. It pulls the plane backwards and it is, it's friction. We can see drag in a lot of things in schools. It is stuff like the negativity that I was talking about just a few minutes ago. It is the flaws and missteps that happen whenever you're trying to do something new, you're going to make a lot of mistakes, and that can give you a lot of self-doubt about whether this is really going to actually work. So all of that stuff creates friction. And also there's fatigue, because all teachers are tired all the time. We've already got too much to do, and so somebody shows up with some idea, and we say, great. One more thing to do. So all of these things can slow down our forward progress. That's all drag. What works in opposition to drag is thrust. In a plane, thrust is created entirely by the engine. That is what moves the plane forward. And when we're talking about change in schools, thrust is generated entirely by you. So four forces. We already spend a lot of time talking about lift, about the, the fine tuning that we can do to our craft. So for right now, I'm going to set that aside. We also work a lot on how to deal with the weight that we are given. Uh, a lot of times that's done on a policy level. For, so for right now, I'm going to set that aside too. I don't think we talk enough about these other two things, how we increase thrust and how we reduce drag so that we can start making these excellent, amazing things happen in our schools. What I have for you are nine principles, nine suggestions, tips, ideas that can help you to increase your thrust and reduce your drag. They're disappearing, but we're going to remember them all. <laughs> I have a whole mnemonic device, so don't worry. It's the, you're going to get them again. OK. My hope, by the way, these nine things, where they came from, they came from a variety of sources. I learned them from people who write business books about organizational change and what it takes to move a whole organization forward. They came from instructional coaches that I've talked to, people who have worked with teachers about how they can get, you know, change their practices. Um, some of them have come from my own personal trial and error. 
my own mistakes. And a lot of them have also come from teachers that I've talked to. So I've spent the last six years talking to teachers who have done incredible things. And I've asked them, what is it that made the difference? What is it that actually got you to the point where you said, I have this idea, and you made it happen? My hope, or my promise to you, because I know we've got a room full of people that are excited about some new idea that they want to take back to their schools, is that you will have found something by the time we're done, at least one of these nine things, that will help you get your plane moving forward a little bit better. So the first one is take a breath. When I hear about a new idea that I like, that I want to try, I want to do it right now, and I want everybody to come with me, and I want us to all do it immediately. That doesn't work that well. When you come running at people with that kind of enthusiasm and a half-baked plan, it typically doesn't succeed. So, right now, you're fired up about this new thing that you want to try in your school. What I would suggest to you is that you take a breath and you ask yourself a couple of questions to really think through what this is that you want to do so that before you start to approach your stakeholders, you've thought through some things. This is a couple of questions I think you should be asking yourself. First of all, what problem does this thing solve? Is it actually a problem that other people would recognize, and do they think it's a problem? And so if not, we need to define the problem that this thing is going to solve. What are the obstacles? What's going to get in the way of us actually implementing this plan? Can I think through those obstacles so that maybe I can figure out ahead of time how to overcome them? That's going to reduce your drag, too. Do I have any proof? It sounds like a good idea, but is there any evidence at all that this thing is going to work? And you can find that proof in academic research. You can find it from schools that have already been doing it. And you can get testimonials from people that have already been there. But it would be a good idea to find some evidence that this thing is going to make a difference if you want to convince other people to join you. Can I find a guide? Can I find someone else who has already been down this road who can give me and my other people here some advice on how to do this, some advice on some trial and error that they've already been through? And finally, what is my long-term vision? If you're only looking a few steps ahead, again, it may be hard to get people on board. But if you can see where this is going to lead further down the road, then that is also going to get other people inspired about trying it too. So here's the mnemonic device. We're going to be dividing ourselves into eight sections. because so I want you to be able to remember these nine points, but we're not going to do this for the ninth one. So that last row of people, all the way down to the back, we're going to use a, a teaching technique called total physical response, and we're going to do a gesture. So you guys are going to be number one. And what I'd like you to do is this. Just, we're going to do like the meditation hands and say, take a breath. So first row over there, what is number one? You don't need to get louder than that. All the way back, what is number one? Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. OK, I will be right back to you. Number two is find allies. Launching something brand new or introducing a new idea by yourself is really hard, but it gets a lot easier if you are on a team of people, even if it's just a team of two people. Because when you have a group, that helps you to clarify your vision, first of all. That's more thrust. It helps you to sort of deal with some of the negativity. You've got people to, to talk with about that. And it also makes your crazy idea seem a little bit less crazy to everybody else. And the best evidence that I have seen of this comes from this video from a guy named Derek Sivers. It's called First Follower. And this really illustrates how powerful it can be if you can even get one person on board with you. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. 
Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is um, how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. I'm pretty sure I cried the first time I watched that. I just was so moved by it. It's just so silly. Okay, so that is the second one. In honor of the dancing man. And this is going to be, okay, not this whole section, but the half of this section all the way down. Our gesture for find allies is just going to be find allies. Do a little dance. So I'm going to count one, two, three. You guys are awesome. Number one is what? Number two? You guys are awesome. All right. Number three is set precise goals. This seems kind of like a no-duh. But really, when I look back at some of my own attempts to implement something new, I see a startling lack of goal setting. What I usually see and what I hear about a lot of time are, are dreams. You hear, oh yeah, we want to really let's we want to do Genius Hour this year. We're gonna start implementing restorative justice practices. We gotta we gotta change our grading practices. We're gonna start a school garden. We, gotta, we really should be starting to work on improving our cultural competency. We have a lot of these dreams, but a lot of times, unless we set them down as actual goals, they never happen. It's just one of those things we want to get to eventually. So I'm gonna go to a, a standard that a lot of people are already familiar with, which is SMART goals. And this is just a framework that forces us to be disciplined about our goals. And I'm going to show you just one example of turning a dream into an actual goal. We're going to take this one of do genius hour. So that's a dream. And that may be a dream that people in your school have had for a couple years now. And it's just, yeah, we just never seem to get around to it. So this is what it would look like as an actual goal. By December 1st, 100 fourth and fifth grade students will give final genius hour presentations. The presentation is what happens at the end of a genius hour cycle. Students talk about what they learn and so on. So that is your end goal. And you can make it more precise by saying at least 80% of those students will score a three or four on the presentation. This is assuming that a group of smart teachers have gotten together and defined really clear, solid criteria for what it's going to look like. So if that number of kids have been successful, then we have accomplished something. And this meets the criteria. It's specific. We're talking about them getting this presentation done. We're measuring it with that score. It's achievable. It's only 100 kids in your school. It's not all of the kids in the entire school. Um, relevant, it's genius hour. And it's also timely. We've actually set a date for when this is going to happen. Here's the thing, though. This is, this is a really good start. This is a goal, but it is not a plan. If you're actually going to get that to happen, now you've got to work backwards from that end point. This is a plan. We start back in August. Let's get a commitment from the teachers that are going to be on board. 
Let's choose our training materials and so, so that we know what we're even doing. Then maybe by around September 15th, we've developed that rubric because that's good backward design. We want to know what we're looking for at the end if we're going to do this right. Then maybe by October 1st, the kids are going to make their pitches on the topics that they're going to do. And then all this time, we're doing Genius Hour, doing Genius Hour. They'll have their drafts of their presentation maybe by mid-November. And then we have reached our goal of having them give their presentations on December 1st. So unless you actually, and that could even be spliced up into even smaller sections. This is a plan. And so if you have this big dream that you want to make happen, the only way you're going to get it to happen is to set really, really precise goals. So this section here, we're going to do Katniss Everdeen for this. We're going to use our archery bows and say, set precise goals. So what is number three? Set precise goals. Good. One. Two. Three. Set precise goals. Fantastic. Number four is expect bumps. So remember that beautiful plan? <laughs> It's so clean and pretty right now. So this is how it's probably going to look once it's all done. Because stuff happens. You know, we have weather delays. We have tech glitches. People drop out of the program. If you are prepared for this kind of a mess, then you're going to be more successful. If you expect the pretty plan to go as planned, then it's going to end up freaking you out. This is a good illustration. Here's your plan. Here is what it ultimately ends up looking like. So we will be more successful if we actually know those bumps are coming and we have a plan for that. So this is what planning for that actually could look like, because there are some specific things that you can do to plan for them. One would be to build in buffer time. So in your schedule of events that are going to happen to meet your goal, Build in some stuff that is, is empty completely, empty days, empty weeks that isn't a part of your plan so that you've got a margin in there for mistakes to happen and delays instead of scheduling things out really, really tightly. Another is to make it a part of your culture to ask what can we learn from this whenever we hit a stumbling block. Instead of freaking out and saying, this isn't going well at all, we say, OK, what can we learn from this before we move on? And let's stop and process. Also, when you encounter those obstacles, learn how to celebrate the small successes. Look at, these, look at these two pictures again. After I looked at them a while, I noticed something. One flag in the top picture, four flags in the bottom picture. To me, I'm reading that as four little celebrations. Heck yeah, we got here. Let's plant the flag, let's celebrate, and let's enjoy this moment. Instead of just being like, oh my gosh, everything's going wrong. Just instead say, yeah, look at what we just did. Okay. And then the last suggestion for planning for bumps is what I am calling, come at me, bro. <laughs> now, this is just an attitude that can come in handy sometimes. Let's look at this person on the cycle, on the bicycle. Let's imagine, I'm going to say this a woman. If this woman planned to have the, the straight path, then every time she encountered these obstacles, she's going to freak out. But if she knew ahead of time that she was going to have certain obstacles, even better, if someone had said to her, on this journey, you will encounter four tests before you reach your destination. Now she's on an epic adventure. Now she can get to those obstacles, puff up her chest, This attitude is not going to fix all of your problems. But when you are in the process of trying to implement change and you get to certain moments where it's just really not going well, it may be a time to turn to each other and say, I think we're having a come at me bro moment. <laughs> so this one is easy. So we did one, two, three, four. This is the half of this. Expect bumps is just going to be like this. So just say to me, expect bumps. Go. Good. One, two, three, four. Thank you. Number five is invite. One mistake that we make when we are trying to get people on board or implement a wide scale change in our schools is we do too much telling and not enough asking. When you tell 
professionals, adults, that they're just gonna do something, they tend to not like it very much. And so by just adjusting the way that we approach this, we can end up getting a lot more buy-in. So instead of saying to people the message of, you know, you're doing this wrong, whatever it is that we're doing, we're doing it wrong, you could say something like, how many of your students have been successful with the current approach? Or instead of saying something like, you're gonna have to start doing it this way, whatever this new thing is, you could say, what if you tried this? Instead of, here's what you need to do, you could say, which of these would be the best fit for you? So little changes in the way that we approach things, you're inviting people to participate instead of saying you have to and that's all there is to it. Now apart from changing the way we say things, there are also some um, structural things that we can do, some systems that we can put into place that make this just built in. One of them is to use something like a learning menu. Now I see this all the time with students when we inter inter um, differentiate instruction for them, but I don't see it enough for adults. And so if we are trying to get the people in our school on board with something, suppose we wanted to start doing more restorative practices, shifting over our discipline practices to that. Instead of just saying, we're all gonna go to this training and then we're all gonna start doing this, you could offer, and then blow this up for you, offer them some choices. This has two book studies, a podcast to listen to, a video to watch, a Voxer chat to participate in. Instead of saying, let's all do this one thing, you could say, in the next two months, I want you to choose two of these things, whatever works best for you, and then we'll all come back together and talk about what we learn. It's treating people like professionals who know what works best for them. Another system that works really well is called voluntary piloting, which I learned about from one of my readers that are doing this in a school. Instead of having everybody do this new thing, that would be everybody, you just choose volunteers, or you ask for volunteers. Who is excited about this idea? Who wants to try it? Who wants to be part of the pilot group? They do it. They spend months or even a year trying this thing, generating some buzz. Other people are watching what they're doing, and then over time, more people start to join them, and maybe then you eventually have your whole staff on board, but they've done it by choice instead of by force. So our gesture for invite is gonna be this group right here, and we are just going to go invite. So one, two, three, invite, thank you. Number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five, invite. thank you. Everyone is doing very well. Number six is my favorite, it is validate. At some point, someone is going to say something negative about your thing that you're trying to do. And how you react to that is gonna make all the difference. So, you could um, argue with them, try to change their mind. You could double down on the positivity and just cheerlead right past what they're saying. You could just dismiss it and be like, oh, that's not really an issue. Um, or you could take a really passive route and just ignore it entirely and then just go into another person's classroom and talk about them behind their back. I'm not saying that's what I did, but I'm, I could get a little passive. None of those things are ever gonna get those people on board. So what I would suggest is that you try validation. Validation is not the same thing as agreeing with the thing that the person is saying. It is just recognizing and affirming the feelings or perspective of another person. It is acknowledging that that thing is true for them. And it is one of the quickest, simplest ways to ease tension and build trust and actually start moving toward a solution. It's simple, but it is not easy. Because we are really used to clinging to our own ideas. And so dealing with somebody who disagrees with us is just not that comfortable. And it really requires a shift in perspective. It requires us to really start to see them from their, own, from their point of view. I saw a quote um, in a book by Elena Aguilar called Onward that she wrote last year, and it really, really is what changed my perspective on this. So I'm gonna show it to you. Behind every cynic is someone whose heart has been broken. When I first got on stage today, I talked about the groupers, and I'm really separated 
an us versus them kind of a dynamic, the negative teachers and the positive teachers. And I think that's really unfair because a lot of those people who I was calling groupers, they were probably the people at their school at one time who had the great ideas, and then they just, it didn't go well. I think the people who we think of as the ones who give the pushback, they want to see change happen. They recognize the problems. They want good things to happen, but they just don't want to be disappointed. And disappointment has been a reality for them. These are all legitimate concerns. They all come from a real place. And behind some of these are some even deeper concerns. We've got teachers right now in our country that cannot pay their mortgage. We've got people who are dealing with students who are so far behind in grade level that they're afraid to try anything new. There's a lot of teachers who don't feel confident and they don't want to be embarrassed. We've got teachers who are so strapped for time that they cannot balance home life and work life at all, and so they don't want to hear about this new thing that's going to take a lot of time. And we've also got teachers who are so focused on one specific problem that, yeah, your idea sounds cool, but what about this other thing that I care so much about that no one is paying attention to? Ignoring all of the pushback doesn't make it go away. So we're better off dealing with it head on, validating the concerns, and basically letting people know that, yes, we see reality the same way that they do. Because if they don't think we see the same reality, they're never, ever going to want to join us on our big journey. So I'm going to give you an example. How you validate, in case this is not something you have a lot of experience with, is it's, it's pretty simple. You just reflect the content of what the person is saying. You acknowledge the emotion that they're experiencing and you communicate acceptance of that. And so I'll show you what this can look like in practice. Suppose I am at a professional development session on blended learning and I am sitting near my colleague, Joan. Uh, the presenter is talking about blended learning and trying to get our school on board. And so the presenter is really excited about it and you know, getting everybody really pumped about it. And then Joan just kind of says to the people at our table, it's kind of impossible when we have 10 working Chromebooks for the whole school. Now, I know that we have more than 10 working Chromebooks at our school. However, Joan does have a point. We don't have enough Chromebooks at our school for everybody to really do blended learning well. She has a point. And if I just say, oh, it's going to be fine. Blended learning is great. Everybody get on board. Then she's going to be like, whatever. Like, you don't get it at all. And she's just going to get more entrenched in her point of view. But what I could do is say something kind of like this. It is hard to picture it without more devices. Now, I'm not agreeing that it's impossible here, but I am just acknowledging to her that, yes, that is a situation that we're going to have to deal with if we're going to make this work. This is not going to make Joan suddenly jump on the blended learning bandwagon. But what I'm communicating to her is, you are not crazy. Yes, that's an issue. We're going to have to deal with that. And so maybe it'll just sort of soften her up a little bit so that we no longer have this divide between the positive and the negative teachers. We've got somebody who's pointing out a real problem. If we listen to her, then we might end up actually with a more practical solution to all of this. So when you find yourself dealing with pushback, ask yourself, am I validating this concern or am I just creating a little bit more of a divide? So our gesture for validate is going to be, and that's going to be this slice right here. We're just going to do this. Validate. <laughs> I see you. OK, so one, two, three. Validate. Good. Let's go back to the beginning. Number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. Number five. And number six. Okay, good. Number seven is be transparent. This was the advice that I got most from the teachers that I talked to who have really brought about big changes in their school. So many of them said, you've got to be really, really transparent about what you're doing. And they have said, especially about your failures. When you make your journey or your attempts to change things really, really open and public, it makes you more approachable to the other people in your school. You're not just huddled off in some corner of the building doing this secret thing. 
It also makes you more accountable. So it's kind of like, you know, I'm going to run a marathon next year. I'm going to tell everybody about it. So now you have to actually do it. It also makes you easier to follow, just like the dancing guy in the video. If, you, if you're easier to follow, then people will be more likely to follow you. So if they can see the process that you're going through, then they may be more likely to, to follow you. You can do this in a lot of different ways. You could do it by keeping like a blog that you share with your faculty. Um, maybe you can do it at meetings. Ask your administrator if you can just give a quick two-minute summary at the end of every meeting. Just, here's our progress in our group that we're doing this thing in. Um, it could be in like a newsletter or something you post up on a bulletin board. Or if you get really ambitious, you might want to have a series of videos or podcasts that you do where you're talking about it, especially if it's a complex, long-term thing, so that people can really hear about the whole process in a nice, you know, in-depth way. So be transparent. That is... We've got eight sections, so that's going to be this slice of this, and we're going to just we're going to wipe the window and reveal. So be transparent. Sorry, I didn't count for you. One, two, three. Be transparent. Good. One. Take a breath. Two. Three. Number four. Expect bumps. Five. Invite. Six. Eight. And seven. I'm not seeing much of a flourish, really. I'm just kind of me. <laughs> the flourish is fun. Number eight is praise. There is a saying that you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. And so if you are finding yourself really stuck in your process, it may be that a little bit more praise is needed. So I'm going to go back to Joan. Let's suppose I have been doing my blended learning for a while. Now, Joan is still not on board yet. She's doing her own thing. But I'm starting to realize that I'm having a problem because even though I'm really into this blended learning thing, I've never been great at procedures and structure. Things are a little messy in my class. And so what I know about Joan is that she runs a tight ship. She's really good at that type of thing. So what I say to her is, can you help me set up better procedures with my blended learning? And Joan has a glow about her now because I have recognized something that she has to contribute. Even though she is not on board with this new initiative, she has got a lot to offer. A lot of the teachers that we have labeled as sort of, you know, dinosaurs, that they're not going to try anything new, they've been around too long, they're close to retirement, they've got, they've got a lot to offer. They have got tons of experience, they've seen a lot of kids come and go, and if we can actually pull them into the process based on those strengths that they have, if we can recognize all the value that they bring to, to teaching in general, we might be able to actually get them on board also. Now, I need to do this with integrity. It's not to try to trick her into getting into this. This is just she can really help me get some procedures. So if I pull her into my classroom, have her observe a little bit, and then get some advice from her about how to make the system work a little bit better, it will also have that side effect of Joan getting closer to the blended learning process and maybe realizing, oh, this is actually not as intimidating as I thought it was. Maybe I could do this. And maybe it gets her on board. Maybe it doesn't, but maybe it does. If anything, she's at least more softened to the process and to the idea. She's not as resistant, because it's no longer an us versus them. We are all helping each other. So for the last one, and that is my last section over here, for praise, we're going to do the Wayne's World hands. And if you don't know what Wayne's World is, then we're, some of us are really old in here. But <laughs> um, they used to do this thing called we're not worthy. So this is going to be praise. All right, so go. Praise. All right, let's run it all the way through one last time. Number one, breath. Number two, find allies. Number three, set precise goals. Number four, expect bumps. Five, invite. Six, validate. Seven, be trans. And eight, praise. Awesome. The ninth one, I'm not going to have a gesture because it's what I'm going to end with. Number nine is a principle that I am calling dig deep. When we are trying to do something worthwhile but difficult, we will almost always reach a point where we just want to give up, where we say, enough of this, let's just go back to the way we were doing it before, because this is too hard. These are the times that test us. These are the times that really make a divide between ordinary and extraordinary. 
and they ask us to find something in ourselves that we really didn't think was there. For the past couple of years, I've been doing something called CrossFit. If you don't have somebody in your life who never shuts up about CrossFit, <laughs> I will quickly explain to you what it is. It is an exercise program where we challenge ourselves in every possible way physically. So we lift really heavy weights, and we push heavy things around in parking lots, and we climb ropes, and we jump on boxes, and we flip upside down and do handstand push-ups. It's hard. It's really hard. We complain all the time. And pretty much in every workout, we want to quit. Those of us who stay and make progress, we do so because we have learned how to work through the discomfort. The person I have learned this from the most is one of my coaches. His name is Steven. And in regular life, if you didn't know him in the gym, you would think Steven was just this nice regular guy. He's a butcher. He takes pictures with his cute little niece all the time. He's just this regular nice guy. But he has this other side to him that I only saw for the first time when he was actually the one with the barbell in his hand. And it was, it was such a sight. See, Steven doesn't just do the workouts. He throws his whole self into them. He makes these crazy faces and, and these cries of pain, and he moves like he is literally on fire. And the first time I saw him, it was just stunning to me, but I remembered it later when I was working out because he goes to a place that most people aren't willing to go to. It's too vulnerable, it is too raw, and he does it every single time. And so after I saw that, I started to sort of channel him when I was doing my own workouts, when I had an 85-pound barbell in my hand and I had already thrown it over my head 19 times and I was supposed to do one more. <laughs> and all I wanted to do was just let it go and shake out my hands and breathe again. And I would think about Steven and how the reason that he crushes so many workouts and does so much better than the rest of us is not because he started out naturally stronger than everybody else. It's because of this. It's because of this fight. And he tries to get us there when we're working out, when he can see that we're about ready to give up. He'll talk to us. He'll say, find another gear, Jen. It's time for you to go to your dark place. It's time to dig deep. <laughs> and sometimes it works. We use that language. You hear it all the time in sports movies whenever we're talking about athletics. But for some reason, we don't talk that way in education. But what we're doing is so much more consequential than scoring a point or winning a game. We are affecting the trajectory of people's lives every day. So I think we need to start using that kind of language. One more quote I want to show you that I think really captures this sentiment well. This is from Amy Fast. Find me someone who settles for average in teaching, and I will show you someone who doesn't understand the magnitude of the mission. We are on a mission of incredible magnitude. So when we start to get to a point where we want to give up, and we want to go back to the way things were because it's just easy and more comfortable, that's the time for us to turn to each other and say, it is time to find another gear. It is time to go to that dark place. It is time to dig deep. Change in general is complicated and difficult. And what I hope that I have done is give you the vocabulary to navigate it so that when you encounter unbearable drag, you can decide if this is a problem that needs more lift or more thrust and start making exceptional things happen in your schools. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. And I think we have I think we have some questions. I don't know. Have some come up? Here we go. Okay. So what I've been told is that I can sort of look here and decide what, and you all have upvoted some. 
I like this first one. I'm gonna go with this first one. With so many teachers leaving the profession, what is the difference between a grouper and a teacher who is trying to balance their well-being? I think the different, well, a teacher that's trying to balance their well-being is someone who's trying to stay and, and actually do a good job. And I, what I'm starting to notice is that the teachers that are getting good at, at getting that balance are starting to recognize that a lot of the things that consume a ton of our time at schools are things that are not going to have any impact. And so what we're looking at is what is going to have the biggest impact and also how can I save myself so that I can keep serving my kids. I think with a grouper, somebody that we would label a grouper, um, I think that that person has has hit a point where they're just resigned and they've just kind of given up and they're no longer being proactive about um, taking control of the situation that they're in and doing what they know is right. So I really do think the difference is in the, the attitude. What are the things we should stop spending time on in schools in order to make time for the good stuff? Um, testing. I, I don't really understand, and this is the thing that that's boggles my mind. Every single day, that's all I see. I see everybody on Twitter, I hear everybody saying, we need to stop the craziness around testing. Not even the testing itself, but the test prep that some schools are doing. And I hear everyone saying, yeah, we need it. For whatever reason, I guess no one's stopping, or no one's stopping enough. Um, but that, the craziness around trying to get our, our kids' test scores, it's just got to stop. Do you think we need to start involving students in designing and implementing new ideas? Yes, even in elementary schools. Yes, I just went to the greatest session yesterday on design. It was design thinking, liberatory design thinking, um, which is an interesting phrase to wrap your head around. But, but yes, I think we do. And I think, I think the answer to that is somewhere in design thinking and, and um, applying those processes and inviting students to participate in them. Yes, I do. And elementary schools would be great, because elementary kids have fantastic ideas. I feel, I'm going to go to the second one. I feel some compassion for the groupers. Surely they cared at some point and were damaged by experience. What can they do for them to reignite? So what can we do to reignite their dreams? So I don't know what time this question came in, and if maybe some of the stuff that I talked about earlier already addressed it. But I do think that the validation is key. Um, and the, the noticing what they have to offer and bringing them in based on those contributions and those skills, I think that's really important. How do you treat the underlying function of the group or behaviors? Underpaid, disrespected ideas come from people not in the classroom to continue passion. <sighs> See, this is kind of a time issue. Somehow, some of us, need to, to be the ones to deal with the, the policy and the advocacy stuff. And I, I honestly don't know how we make time for that. But whoever you have in your building who is tapped into you know, who to vote for and who to like lobby against or for in terms of making policy changes happen, let's build that person up so that they can go out and do that work. Because we don't all have time for it. And that really, it's the policy level stuff that I think is going to be the only thing that's going to change things like the salaries and the working conditions and all of that stuff. And I so admire people that are out there with their signs and their red t-shirts and they're out there fighting for um, really bigger systemic changes that are going to improve things. And, and I think most of us recognize that we don't have the time or even the knowledge sometimes to even know. I would much rather have somebody say, look, I've been researching this. This is who you vote for on Tuesday. Just go do that. And like, whatever you say, I will do that. If I need to write a postcard, I'll sign it. But let's try to like really build up those people who are doing that work so that we can um, see change happen faster. Do you have a book or a way to see your presentation slides again? Um, it's going to be on YouTube. Um, I, do, I do have it in a handout, but I've made a lot of changes lately, so I will, if you're following me on Twitter, you can send me a direct message and ask me about it, maybe I can send it to you. All right, we've got a couple more minutes. These sound like great tips for administrators. How can admin release their power to allow teacher leaders to have room for this process? Well, yes. I mean, there's so much, there are so many problems in education that are just caused by ego. That, that I, I, some of the best, and there are some tremendous administrators out there. 
who are doing exactly this, who are constantly inviting teachers to participate in getting ideas. And I just, I think, there, <laughs> I think that there are, um, there are masterminds right now for administrators to join up with. Other. I think administration is a very lonely job. So if you are in that role or if you're heading in that role and you can sort of see that this might be something you need to do, getting together with other administrators and seeing how they do this is really important because I think it's scary to let go of that power. But if you can see how someone else is doing it and that it's going well, then that provides a model for, for other administrators to try it. So, so getting together with other administrators is, is key, I think. Um, I'll do the... The second question, principals often ask for top-down directives from district office, but this makes teachers feel that they're being told what to do. This is where I feel a lot of compassion for administrators, because I think they are in a very, very tough spot. They sort of know what needs to be done, but then they're being told from somebody above them, oftentimes someone who has never been in the classroom, uh, you have to do this. I wish I had an answer for this, really. Um, sometimes I think, Sometimes I think with teacher, as teachers, we do the same thing. We close our doors and we say to our kids, okay, this is what we're supposed to do, but let's just do this for five minutes so we can say we did it, and then we're going to go and do the right thing that we know we should be doing. And I think administrators can kind of get away with stuff like that, too. I think we're at a place with education where subversion is really becoming an important thing. That, right? <laughs> that people who know what the right thing is to do need to just start doing it and maybe risking Gosh, when I think about it, I know I was such a great frickin' teacher, and if I had taken more risks, I know I wouldn't have gotten fired for it. And I heard somebody in a session the other day, we were talking about equity and about pushing back and people being afraid of uh, rubbing administrators the wrong way. And the woman sitting next to me said, yeah, there's risk involved. And that's all she said. And I thought, dang. She was just saying, do it anyway. Which, again, you got kids to feed, whatever, that may not be possible for everybody, but I don't know, I think the more we see more people doing it, the more it's gonna happen. And it, it, sometimes it frustrates me when I see how many smart, talented people just keep their mouths shut all the time. And we just have to start rising up. <laughs> what do you see as the biggest changes we could make in the next five years in education? Oh, that's a big question. Gosh. Um, hmm. I guess two things. One, I think that shifting the way that we uh, discipline our students, and that's a big ball of wax, but we are pushing kids out who need to be in school, and it's because we've got really antiquated ideas about dress code and about um, appropriate behavior. and. And also about this whole idea that if we suspend a kid for five days, that's going to discourage other key people from, from misbehaving. So I'm a really strong believer in the potential of restorative practices. It's probably why I used it as an example a couple of times. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of schools think that they're doing restorative practices and they get started and they say, oh, it doesn't work because all they do is they just stop suspending kids and they don't do all of the other work. So I think that really learning how to do restorative practice as well. We'll keep our kids in school and build the relationships that we need so that they feel valued and then they can start doing some of their best work. And then there's a lot of other things. We've got about three more minutes left before the hour's over, so I'm gonna just take a second and look and see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I'm just reading these now. I'm going to answer just. I'm going to answer this question at the bottom. What can young educators do in order to avoid the burnout that comes with the first few years of teaching? And I think I'll probably stop with that one uh, because this is the advice I've been giving people for years, which is to surround yourself with good people and make sure that you are with like-minded people who are going to be just as excited about the work as you are. And this does not mean that they're Pollyannas. This doesn't mean that they don't recognize problems. But you need to be with people that love kids and that love the work that we're doing and really believe in the potential. As soon as you start to hear the people who just only think that everything's going downhill and kids today this and kids today that, run 
from them. You can, you can validate their concerns, but then go to the other room and be with your people because you all can lift each other up in some incredible ways, and, and there is nothing like being supported by colleagues who have the same set of beliefs as you do. And so if you are just getting started, that is the most important thing, and they might not even be in your school. They might be people that you talk to on Twitter, but find them and, and get filled up from them as much as you possibly can, because that is really what's gonna make the difference. I think I'm gonna go ahead and end right there. That's okay, thank you.